So this is verse by verse Bible study. Uh, the intention of verse by verse Bible study is so that you can understand each and every word with all your heart. All right, that's the intention of the verse by verse Bible study is so that you can understand each and every word and the Bible can become more clear for your understanding. All right, Genesis chapter 1, please. Genesis chapter 1. And then we'll read verse 9. Genesis chapter 1. And then we'll read verse 9. The Bible says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. So the meaning of that. So God's speaking, and we're on day number 3 now. On day number 3, God says, Let the waters under the heavens. Now, Oh, not black. Okay, so let's see here. Pretty soon the waters will become black. <laughs> All right. But the waters, remember, they were under the firmament. Now, remember, the firmament is over here. And we're going to find out later on the fourth day. That's where the sun, moon, and stars are going to be at. But the firmament is what divided the waters under and the waters above. So I'm not going to repeat it, but basically the idea is the firmament is in the center. That's the dummy version. The water is underneath, and then the water is above. The water, the water below is what we've discovered from last Genesis study to be seas. Well, we'll just put C to put more correct English. And then... The waters above, we recall, is supposed to be the sea, same thing, but God puts a glass. That's why it's called firmament, because there's something rock solid over there. Now, the bottom, the below part, is called sea. So this is where we see current ocean and seas around our world. Now. Returning back to verse 9, the idea is the waters under the heaven, right here, be gathered together unto one place. So they're going toward one direction. Okay? So then they're all going toward one direction. Why? So that the dry land can appear. Is, that's what the verse says. So in other words then, this dry land was below the waters. The sea was going toward one place. Why? So that the dry land can appear. I mean, look at the verse. That's what the verse says. Yeah, I mean. so, in, so notice that because of that, then that means that this part of the dry land was below sea before. Why? Why is that? It's because, as I have showed you in the previous verses, that's where you get your Genesis gap. Because at Genesis 1-1, this is where Lucifer and the fallen angels were living. They were living in the earth. However, what the Lord did was that he drowned them whole out. Amen. And we covered 2 Peter chapter 3 that this is not just a worldwide flood. This is a universal flood. It flooded everything from all throughout the universe. This is not just uh, the worldwide flood like Noah's flood. That some of the creationists will say. So then we see over here that. Why, we now understand why the dry land was below here. And then God had to gather the waters together to one place so that the dry land can appear, can come out. Now we understand the reasons why. Let's go back. So it says, and it was so at the end of verse 9. In other words, it happened, all right? And it came to pass, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth. So notice that the Lord, he calls this dry land earth. Now notice what he called it. He calls dry land earth. Now notice that when we look back at verse 9 and verse 10, he calls the dry land part earth. When we pick up the soil from the ground, we would call it earth. But then God already created the earth when we go back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So notice here that we see earth 
as at verse 1 already created. But then when he's doing his third day, this is when it's supposed to be created. What's going on here? Because he's talking about dry land and he calls it earth. Whereas he refers to the current planet that we live in at verse 1, earth. So see, there's a difference. What's going on is that at verse 1 and 2, we know what that is. It's that universal flood. And then over here, when we look at verse 10, it's the dry land. Because when you look at throughout your Bible, there's no doubt when you look at a lot of references to earth, it's referring to the current ground that we walk on. It's referring to earth. But then you get other verses, such as the book of Job, that the Bible says, and we believe literally every word what it says, he hanging up the earth upon nothing. But then there are other verses where it shows the dry land earth, where it could hang upon pillars, and etc. The easy explanation to these things is because the Lord gives already a distinguishing here. He shows right here the dry land to be earth. And then he shows where we get our current planet earth, that it's hanging upon nothing. So over here we see from this text, it can give the two distinguishing. Genesis 1 already gives the full outlook of our creation and our current natural surroundings. Let's look at verse 10 again. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. So we've covered that in our previous Genesis study. So remember, the waters were gathered together. And he called that sea. So it makes sense right over here at the firmament, which is the floor part of the third heaven where God lives in, which is above the universe. He calls it what? Sea of glass. So there's no doubt that these two waters is referring to the same water that we study at Genesis chapter 1. Now continue reading on the last part of verse 10. And God saw that it was good. So notice that he referred to all this as good. So his creation is obviously good. Let's keep reading onward. Verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. So God is speaking here again. And he said, let the earth bring forth grass. So notice that we have vegetation here. So we get trees. We get plants. It's on the same day. The herb yielding seed. And the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. So then notice that every herb that we get on our earth, that the Bible says that it yields seed. That's why it will have seed within it. And the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. So each fruit tree will yield, bring forth fruit, now notice it says, after his kind. That's an important phrase that you want to know. You might say, why is after his kind very important? After his kind is very important because it debunks evolution. Amen. Now you might say, what do you mean by that? There's a group, uh, there's scientists that are caving in to evolution. When they cave into evolution, they believe that Obviously, that man evolved from the monkeys, and the monkeys evolved from somebody else and some other creatures all the way back to our earth. But the Bible says we're not all within a common ancestry. So that's what Richard Dawkins tried to do at Berkeley. He tried to point out that the greatest evidence of evolution is that how the scientists formed their classification structure in studying the DNA strands in matched with how the scientists set up with a common ancestry. It's not a matter of common ancestry. It's a matter of a common designer, a common creator. When you have a common father, then all of his creation, you see his handiwork. Same thing with every creators, designers, artists, inventors. You can see a common trait that you see behind the handiwork. It should prove the creationism. It should prove that there is a God rather than evolution. So we see over here that after his kind is proved, Meaning that they only come from themselves. Evolution is completely false. It is full of error. There's no such thing as macroevolution. Macroevolution, what that means is that you can evolve from totally something else. So outside of your species, outside of a totally different thing. 
So the idea is it's not possible. You have to go within. You have to go. So in other words, now look, we believe that uh, that dogs can produce different breeds of dogs, cat with cats, but we don't believe that a dog is going to produce a cat. Now there's a, uh, I'm not going to get too deep, but punctuated equilib equilibrium by Stephen Gould, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, he couldn't see the connections with evolution because there's too much of a gap in between actually. So because there's too much gaps in between, there's no way they can find the next ancestor and the next ancestor. So then he believed in this theory that basically, let's say that a dinosaur lays an egg, then out pops a chicken, like all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, out of nowhere. So that's obviously ridiculous and that cannot happen. So it has to go within their kind. Now, the common argument that you're going to hear from evolutionists and scientists, which I don't know why is their favorite argument, but I see it as a weakness. They say, what does kind mean? Mm -hmm. The reason why is because they want you to explain what kind means and then uh, delve it into scientific terms. Mm -hmm. They want you to explain it in scientific terms so that once you have your scientific definition, then what they can do is try to debunk it by looking at other portions of scriptures that no amount of those animals could then fit inside Noah's Ark or that your scientific term or definition of what a species kind or etc. is does not match with the scientific world. Now, you know what the simple answer to that is? The simple answer to that is, is that they're in your territory. You don't go to their territory. You know what I mean by that? Let me tell you what I mean by that. God's the one who threw, threw the term here. Do you know of any scientists who use this word kind? They don't do that. They never use that word. So the idea is we're going by God's biblical language here. So, I mean, if God says that's a different kind of animal or that's a different kind of animal, even a child can figure it, that out. Mm -hmm. A horse is a different kind of animal from a cat. Yeah. A bird is a... A crow is a different kind of an animal from a fish. See, it's that simple. God is using layman simplistic terms. That's very important. All right? So then, like, why? Because God makes the Bible simple so that any fool can understand except the brilliant PhD evolutionists because they make up their own terms out of La La Land. All right? They always throw in their own terms, and God's like, I don't care how many years you spend creating these terms, all right? I, I put my term over there. Amen. Let me call it kind, all right? Amen. You ever seen a PhD scientist be so stupid to tell a child, well, uh, you know, that's a different kind of animal, mama, a horse from a cow or et cetera, that you see a PhD scientist making a big deal and say, no, what we call it in these kind of subterms, no! They're not going to be so dumb to do that. Why? Because it burdens the child. Because they know how ridiculous it is to waste time with that. And you got to understand that's the same thing with God over here. He's not giving you a biological terminology textbook with 500 definitions for you to memorize. When God said he created man, he didn't ask you for how many skeleton, skeleton bones are in the body. He's just giving a story. The story is... The plants, they reproduce after their kind. That's a story. It's a st he's giving a story here, and then you're not going to get all nitpicky and technical and say, well, what this means is, then you get rid of the story, yeah. okay? Because the point of the King James Bible, which scholars cannot deny, the language of it is undoubtedly powerful, dramatic, and like Shakespearean language that they say do not change the words and they criticize the modern Bible versions for doing that. Amen. That's important to understand. All right, uh, hopefully uh, the mic is not too low and the people can hear it. I know that in previous videos they said that it kind of did, so hopefully that's not the case. All right, so God is giving you here the story of man and his creation, and you don't have to interrupt and ruin the story while we're re reading it, okay? Lay off, all right? Lay off. If you want to do scientific terms, save it for class, bud. I mean, you don't do that in a drinking party with, you know, lost people and college students, right? You don't get all technical and say, well, technically, you know, that soda, what we call it is, 
Leave it alone, it's a drink, okay? A drink is a drink. If you're out at a drinking party with college buddies, you don't see them throwing out scientific terminologies of what the drink should be. Well, what that drink should be called is, do you follow what I'm saying? What I'm trying to do is this. I'm not trying to say, go out and drink, okay? I'm trying to give that even lost sinners don't use scientific jargon all the time. All right? This is just normal human language. Leave it alone. Oh, man. What do you think you're reading, man? All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Verse 11, whose seed is in itself. Now, notice the wording. The seed is in itself. See, the Lord makes it very specific that the seed is in itself, and these plants will reproduce after these plants. He makes it that specific. The Bible keeps reading on. Upon the earth, so this is all over the earth now, the dry land, and it was so, and it came to pass. Let's keep reading. And the earth brought forth grass. So now we see that the dry land here that God called earth is now producing out grass. So it's not just dry now. Now there's vegetation. Let's keep reading. An herb yielding seed after his kind. So it's repeating again. Herb is bringing forth, yielding, reproducing seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit. So tree produces its own fruits. Whose seed was in itself. So the seed is within these. That's why uh, gardeners and people, they can take the seeds out of certain plants and vegetation and start to reproduce and yield fruit. After his kind... And God saw that it was good. So God saw that everything he made is good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So this is now the third day. Notice literal 24 hours. It says evening and morning. So it shows it's 24 hours. It's not long ages of time like evolution. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. So notice here that there are lights now in the firmament of the heaven. Now, remember, what is this heaven? We go back at verse 8, and God called the firmament heaven. So now we're right here at the firmament, okay? So now God is putting sun, moon, and the stars here. But uh, let's keep reading on. That way you can understand. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. So then these lights, let's call it lights for now, okay? So then these lights, whatever they are, and God will explain it later on, they divide day from the night. Now remember, if you all recall, the first day, God already did that, right? He already divided the day from the night. But today we're having the sun, moon, and stars doing that for us, which is again proof that I showed you in our previous Bible study, that this light and this darkness is totally different. This light and this darkness, it's totally different. It's not referring to the current, in our current world, how we would perceive light from the sun and then the moon to shine during the darkness. No, remember, it's that, that's why the Genesis gap answers so many questions. Where did the darkness come from? And then why did God have to separate darkness from the light? Because the Genesis gap showed you, let's review, okay? God sent a universal flood, all right? Not just all around the world, it's universal, all right? It filled up everything throughout the universe, this flood. So then what God had to do now is, this is all chaos. It's not creation. It's not something nice and dandy. It's destruction. I've explained that at verse 1 and 2. One is creation. Two, when you read that language, that's destruction. Uh, Let me just uh, briefly review real quick. So then a good example that I would mention is if I say that I built a house and all of a sudden the the house was empty and filled up with waters, then what are you going to think in your mind? You're automatically going to think that he built a house and then obviously there was a little bit of uh, flooding or plumbing issues that happened in the house. So then people are not living in there but are getting out of there. So see, that's just common sense. So one and two... That matches with the Genesis gap that God created the earth, heaven and the earth. But then all of a sudden, throughout the universe, heaven and earth, it's flooded. Why? Because it's a sign that God 
had to destroy. And then we looked at, at 2 Peter 3 and the book of Job, where there were sons of God, fallen angels. Mm -hmm. So I have expounded that a lot more at our previous Genesis study. And then what I would recommend is to watch the gap theory on yeah. YouTube. I did a teaching on the gap theory, and that gives a lot more persuasive arguments. But I'm just doing little tidbits here, all right? For, so for time's sake, that way I can resume to the next verses. Amen. So then resuming on to the next verses, the point is, so then with this whole destruction, God has to clean house. Because he spread darkness all around too. Why? Because he reserved the fallen angels for darkness. Well, you looked at those verses on that. Yeah. He sent the flood waters. Why? Because of the fallen angels. So darkness and flood waters were for destruction because of the fallen angels. So then God has to get rid of this destructive parts, the destructive parts. So what did he do? So then the water and the darkness. Day number one, he got rid of the darkness by dividing light from darkness. And God called the light day, darkness he called night. But there were no sun, moon, and stars and uh, the, the years, seasons, and all that. They weren't operating yet through the sun, moon, and stars. So then what was night and what was day? We already studied that. The day was referring to Jesus Christ being the light. And the darkness was already spread out throughout our whole universe. Which is why you're going to see up there that it's all dark. So throughout outer space here, we see all that's filled with darkness. But there's waters in it too, remember, throughout the universe. So then God had to separate the waters. So then I showed you before when he separated the waters, this is where we have, uh, well, so right here you see this pyramid. And this pyramid is referring to our universe. And then the earth, let's just uh, do it for, uh, pic uh, just for picture's sake, okay? This is not an accurate representation. But let's say the earth is over here. And then remember, there's darkness all over here and waters all over here. So then what God did was the waters below, he called seas, right? So then it's right here. Now remember, at verse 2 and 3, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So God was being here. All right, so from here, he's looking at his point of view. The waters below, he called seas. And then we notice that the waters above, all right, that's that sea. That's the sea again, but it's referring to the sea of glass. And that's where we're going to put our number seven, but I'll explain a little bit more about that. There's some interesting stuff on that. So then the above point of view here is where he puts the sea over here of glass and the below over here is where he puts the water sea and then the dry land earth. So then that's what he did with the waters. So then we see what he did with the darkness. So remember the darkness is all throughout here, throughout the universe. He separated light from darkness. This is God being light. That's why heaven has no darkness. That's why the Bible says that lost people, they are cast into outer darkness where there shall be weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Heaven is referred to as light and day. We saw that uh, at Revelation 21, 22. There shall be no night there. See that? So those are the terms of day and night. But now that we come to the fourth day, look at this now. So now he's resetting lights here. So this shows that the light of uh, verse 1, uh, verse 3 and onward, the light at the first day of creation is different from the light here. That how we would perceive in our world today. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. So then day and night is divided by these lights. But God himself was the one who divided the light, the day and the night at verses 3 through 5, right? God himself was the one. But then now God is letting the sun, moon, and the stars, these lights in our universe do it. So there's no doubt. There are different types, different types of lights here. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So then we see that whatever these lights are, God says that they're going to be where you can perceive signs from. So that's why during the old days, people, when they look at the sun, moon, and stars, then they could tell from the signs, you know, what's going to happen and then what the, uh, perhaps looking at the clouds, like Jesus says, that when you look at uh, the weather out there, that you can perceive signs. 
So that's what, the, what, what, they're, what these things are there for, so that mankind can perceive. They're also there for seasons. So that's why we get our four seasons today. And for days, that's where we get our days. And then the people who try to calculate the days, they put it to 365 days per year. But as you know from history, calendars are so messed up. So when mankind divides the days, the seasons, and everything, they're only halfway accurate compared to God. God's timing of things. He always, all he has to do is send a little cataclysmic throughout the universe, stop time a little bit, and then throw the calendars off again for mankind. That's why uh, there are rapture date setters who have a hard time dating the rapture. Why? Because calendars are thrown off. So when you do stuff like that, you have to be careful. God does that to teach mankind a lesson. We're turning to our main text here. And let them be for lights in the ferment of the heaven. So now we see that. Ah, okay. So then we see that the sun, moon, and stars, or whatever these lights are, they're in the ferment of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So now they're giving light upon the earth. And it was so. It came to pass. God did that. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day. So we got the sun here. And the lesser light to rule the night. So we got the moon here. So notice that's where we get the sun and moon from. So we get greater light to rule the day. Lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So look at Psalms 147. Keep your hand here. Keep your hand here. And go to Psalms 147 please. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 147. I'm not used to speaking at a big room. As you might recall <laughs> in previous videos, I was teaching at a smaller room. <laughs> so I have to be a little bit louder because we don't have mics here. All right, Psalms chapter 147. I trust uh, people can hear me. Uh, if you don't, just let me know. All right, Psalms chapter 147. Now, you notice how great our God is at Genesis 1.16? Keep Notice the wording here. He says the sun to rule the day, the moon to rule the night. He made the stars also. Put that also. Oh, by the way, like also and in addition, Lord's like might as well throw, throw out in a couple stars. But in his mind when he's saying a couple stars here, this is where all the scientists are like saying – they're like, oh, we've yet to discover all these stars and all these objects out there in outer space. And there's like trillions, if not gazillions. And then they try to make up names for them and they lose count of the names. And then they have to have a computer to keep or uh, they have to write notes to keep up all the names. And then it's so amazing how our world, they just trust scientists so much when they have to uh, they have to have a computer. They have to write it down. They have to take years and years, and they still didn't discover everything out there that God created the stars. It's so amazing that mankind spends so much time on that, and mankind trusts in man, but not God. You know what? God, it's not a problem for him. God says, oh, by the way, I just made the stars like that. <laughs> Threw it out there. It's that simple. Amen. Okay, look at Psalms chapter 147. You know, God, when he already created how many stars, God knows, trillions upon trillions, who knows. But then, you know what he did? He already put the names. And he already has the number. He already knows each one. Amen. Look at verse 4. Yeah. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their what? Names. names. Isn't that a miracle? Amen. Scientists, you know how long they'll, have, they'll probably take naming just one star? Just one star. How long does it take for all of you to name one baby that you give birth? You, you take special time. The Lord is not a problem. Boom, just like that. Amen. That's why Adam, he had the ability to give names. So he had a super brain. There's no doubt about that. Today, in our world, we take so much time, and we have to have the help of a computer to help us with name finding. What's the most popular name? What's the, most, what's the best name, etc.? And God's like, I already created the name. It's amazing. All right, returning to our main text. That's how great your God is. I mean, uh, it's so amazing how many people do not choose to trust in a being like that. And they choose to trust fallacious, 
beings who are prone to fill with errors. And by the way, scientists, even the best ones, will always admit this. They are prone to mistakes, no matter how many trial and errors and how many experiments that they do to test things. All right, returning to our main text at verse 17. And God set them in the ferment of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So notice here that God set these lights in the ferment of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night. So notice that the star, sun, and moon, they're set in place to give light on the earth. They rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. Why? Because this light now is produced at verse 16. See that? Star, sun, and moon. So these are the lights now. And that's how they divide from uh, light and darkness. Returning to the main text at verse 18. And God saw that it was good. So obviously what God created, it's good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So notice here that God says all of this was created in 24 hours in the fourth day. So you'll notice here that the sun was not created upon uh, where we take billions and billions of years. Yeah. God says 24 hours yeah. like that. Now, that's why Genesis 1 is such a strong problem to the evolutionists today. It's a strong problem because nearly every passage you'll find just contradicts evolution concepts. By the way, if notice that uh, we're going to compare now the third day to the fourth day here. Now, notice that God didn't think that it was the end of the world, that it was too much of a problem for him, and he was biting his fingernails. That, oh my goodness, so then uh, I created a plant. I made a mistake. There's supposed to be sunlight. I made a mistake. Whoopsie doo. Oh, I'm in trouble. Notice that the Lord did not have a problem like today's scientists today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, they freak out. All right, they freak out. So notice that God says, yeah, I can create vegetation and life. And you can imagine one tree said, but didn't Dr. So-and-so at the University of California at Berkeley said that, you know, that I need some water and I need some sunlight. And God's like, I don't care. I'm going to create you because God can create everything out of nothing. His own power can keep the plant going, ongoing for life. Here's another thing. All right. Another thing what destroys evolution is this, is that, look, this is done within 24 hours after the plants were created and made. Within less than 24 hours, they receive the sunlight that they need. So then, if the evolutionists were right that, well, when God did the six days of creation, it means like uh, long ages of time. And within these long ages of times, it could be thousands of years, millions of years, billions of years in between. Hey, dummy, I mean, like, look, you, you think this plant can go on for like billions of years? <laughs> You notice that the greater the intellect and the intelligence of scientists, the more idiocy that we see within the scholastic world. No wonder people online doubt that I graduated from Berkeley. All right, so let's go back. Um, when we go back at uh, verses 9 through 13 and 14 through 19, that the Lord, it wasn't a problem for him. Now, usually the sun should come out first. And plants later, according to the evolutionary teachings, but God's like, no, I'll, I'll just switch it around. Why, Lord? Nah, just for fun, you know. I'll just do that. See what happens. Okay, amen. All right, let's look at verse 20. And God said, so God's speaking again, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. So notice here that, remember, the waters here in our earth, that God says, let it bring forth life. So now we're at the fifth day. So life is being born from water. Now, go to the book of John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Scientists or evolutionists, they like to say that basically life was formed from something liquid. But then the creationists point out a very good point. Other scientists point out a good point that how can you create life uh, from the water, from the ocean, because that's the problem concerning uh, proteins and concerning DNA and all other origins of how our life is formed. If you just put it out of water, you can't just do that. You can actually kill something. 
You can kill life. So then what you ha have to do is you have to have multiple conditions in place. Not just water itself. You have to have all the conditions right in place and has to moment in like that. In a moment of time like that. If you do it in long ages of time, there is no way that life can be born out of the water like that. But then we found some scientific experiments that uh, life can be indeed, be indeed formed out of the water. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> Uh, the, if you believe the Bible, look, if you just believe the half, just the half, the half of Genesis 1, that's not a problem for you. Yeah. All right? Why, why did you waste five years for your PhD and then another five years for your BA and then God knows how many for your master's and pleasing all your professors and doing tons of research? I mean, you just stressed yourself out when you could have finished within five minutes of reading half of the chapter of Genesis 1. All right? Now, you can see why I'm not beloved by the world today, all right? I have no respect for scholarship, all right? I do not have respect for the higher education crowd. It is because of these crowds, they have blinded our worlds with the, what the Bible says, science falsely so-called, at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, the simple answer is the Bible says the uh, light was formed from the waters at day five, but... If it was just like that through long ages of time, it would die. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a really brilliant scientist uh -huh, who puts all the right conditions in place in a lab. Mm -hmm. And then he does it on, instantaneously and puts it all in form. Then it might happen. Yeah. <laughs> and then this stupid scientist who did that says, oh, see, I proved evolution. You just proved intelligent design. What a dummy. <laughs> what a dummy. Do you follow what I'm saying here? All right. I did that deliberately for a reason. All right. All right. So every time they have a scientific experiment to prove evolution, just thank them for proving intelligent design every time. Okay. Okay. So our creator, see, that's, it makes more sense with intelligent design. The creator, he used the water to create life, but he had to do it instantaneously to make sure that all the origins of life, that life needs to breathe, to function, and activate, all those conditions and multiple things, sources are set in place and boom like that. So he had to do that while using the waters. So look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And then we'll look at verse, John chapter 3, and then we'll read Verse 3, that way we can understand the context. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Jesus says to be born again. Now, we obviously know what that means. That means our spiritual birth. It's a second birth. That's different from our physical birth. So Jesus, that's why Jesus said you have to be born again. You need to be saved. So Nicodemus, he doesn't know about the second birth, the spiritual birth. All he knows, this is important so you understand the context, all he knows is a physical birth, a fleshly birth. So Jesus had to explain born again. Why? Because it's not just the first birth, physical birth. It's a second birth, spiritual birth. So Jesus has these two births in mind when he's explaining. You might say, why is that important? Trust me, it's important when you read the next verse, okay? <laughs> verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, one birth, and of the Spirit, second birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Why? You obviously know then. Just like that, obviously. He's talking about the physical birth and the spiritual birth. But there are tons of churches who get it wrong and they think that this is referring to water baptism. Jesus never said baptize here. He never said baptize here. Born of water. We, uh, when a woman is about to give birth to a baby or they would say her water broke. Why? Because we're all born from water. So notice here that Life is formed from water. And Jesus explained, just in case some people still don't get it, Jesus expounded at verse 6. That which is born of the what? 
flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. All right, so if some, you will come across these people who will use John 3 to prove water baptism for salvation. Just show them those verses that I've showed you before, all right? It should be easy. It should be easy to point out the error. All right, go back to Genesis 1, please. Genesis 1. This is interesting. So I'm not going to get too deep here, okay? So I'm just going to abbreviate this. Uh, my advice would be listening to the Revelation verse-by-verse uh, verse Bible study that I did. If you watch that one, it would further expound and further explain about what I'm about to do with you, right? So if I sound crazy, then I, just, I guess I'll just sound crazy, all right, because I won't have time to explain it. All right, so the quote-unquote crazy thing is this, is that this is proof and evidence that the Old Testament from Adam and Eve, you go back 4,000 years, and then the New Testament will be 2,000 years. So this is proof itself that it is against evolution. And how that's the case is because at 2 Peter chapter 3, and we won't turn there, but the Bible says a day with the Lord is a thousand years as a thousand years as one day. How God perceives time is different from how man perceives time. Now, God, he will tell you if a day is literally 24 hours because why? He'll tell you, okay? Genesis 1, he did. He said, no, it's not millions of years. It's 24 hours. All right, so he'll tell you that. But the idea here is that why did God create six? And seven, he did nothing. Remember, everything God does is for a reason. He just don't throw out sporadic numbers. Okay? If we abide by 2 Peter chapter 3, it's because of how God perceives time. He does something different. Day with the Lord is a thousand years. It's a thousand years as one day. So then, if we go back throughout the past 6,000 years approximately of mankind's history, we can see that... For four days, and we look at the four days of creation, we see here that there is no living entity at this time until what? The fifth day. Life born from water. Now, some of you are already jumping ahead because you know what I'm about to say. So when we look at here, when God, if God would perceive time, he says, well, the past 4,000 years right here, there's no life. But then I decide that I will give life right about here. <laughs> and then right about here, I think it's a good time for my son to come down and die for the sins of mankind. And to give life for all, to give eternal life, eternal life for all of mankind. And then it's through his precious and most holy red blood that we gain eternal life. And that is why Jesus said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus that you're born of water, that's the first birth, and of the Spirit. Why? Because you're dead in sins. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is the one that gives you life, and you get eternal life. Yes. And Jesus continued on at John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. What did he say at John chapter 3? He mentioned that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what kind? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. Is it a coincidence that Jesus said that when he mentioned born of water and of the spirit? And why he would talk about born again. Born again. It's amazing. It's amazing. So then this is where Jesus Christ gave eternal life to mankind. And that's why it makes so much sense that in the Old Testament that the life they received is not the same permanent eternal life how we would have it. Their life was conditionary. That's why they have to have the law. They have to abide by the commandments. Mm -hmm. So notice here that during the Old Testament that their dispensations, that their operations that God dealt with them is much, much different compared to us yeah. in the New Testament. Yeah. Now, returning to our main text, at verse 20, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. So the waters bring forth, reproduce abundantly, overflowingly together, the moving creature that hath life. It takes a large amount of water where it comes forth abundantly 
to create creatures that move, that are stirred, and would have life. Yes, it totally matches with you. Go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Notice that the Bible says that when you receive the Holy Spirit of God, that it can have large amounts of water. Yeah. And it moves and it stirs. And then you sense the Holy Spirit moving during a Holy Spirit-filled revival meeting. And then the lost people see that, and that makes them angry, makes them agitated. It makes them accuse you of being a fundamentalist, accuse you of hate speech because you got something that they don't have. It makes an atheist an angry when during a funeral you talk about Jesus and hope of heaven. Yeah. Why would they be angry over about something positive and hopeful during a sad time? See, something in you. John chapter 7. We'll look at verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now notice that it keeps reading on here. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So notice that in this text, that we can see a lot of things that the Lord had in mind when he was creating. When he was creating... The Lord had a lot of things in mind about our spiritual application mm -hmm. as Christians. Later on in the future, what would happen to us? It's amazing. Okay. Going back. Going back to the main text. Going back to the main text. So then, we're supposed to mention about the birds and the fish. I never mentioned that specifically. So we mentioned about the fish from the water. But now we have to mention the birds, the latter part of verse 21. After their kind, now you notice how the Bible keeps repeating after their kind. Right. Why? It's just in case a PhD scientist was looking too much at a microscope that he overlooked that phrase, you know. So the Lord just repeated it again out of courtesy and kindness, you know. And every winged fowl after his kind. So every winged fowl, see, bird that has wings. After his kind. And God saw that it was good. So to, in God's eyes, what did he deem it as? He deemed it as good. Now, you notice here that uh, the Bible says God created great whales. Water bring forth abundantly. Now, this is important. This is, again, proof against the evolutionists. So what they're going to say, Jesus said, Jonah, uh, the Bible says God created a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jesus said it was a whale. So uh, apparently our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ didn't know what he was talking about because he did not have a PhD. And then the scientists would just tell you, a whale is a mammal, not a fish. Good, I'm glad you laughed, okay? I'm glad you laughed. All right, you know what they're doing again? They're doing that previous example, all right? They're being technical, which scientists wouldn't even use, all right? If they were doing casual conversations, all right? They're just being stupid and silly again. God, he can throw the term with however way he wants. You know why? Because he has copyright reasons to do so. Amen. He created them. Amen. What scientist robs God's creation thinks he has the copyright legal rights to name whatever he wants? All right, YouTube strike me for copyright violations? <laughs> what did I do wrong? These guys did the copyright violations against our Lord and Savior. How about that? Every scientist should be sued. <laughs> All right, going back to our main text. Now, obviously, the point is this. Obviously, the point is, is that uh, terms are terms, all right? God gave us language to speak. We can pull up whatever term and concept we want, all right? There's nothing wrong with that. But the point is, is that if God allows us to throw in whatever concept and term we want, why can't he do the same thing? All right. Why is it that, no, Lord, you have to talk the way I talk. He don't have to talk the way you talk. If he talked the way you talk, then we'd all be shot to hell. Yeah. Thank God he doesn't talk like you. Can I get an amen on that? Thank God he don't talk like you. God forbid, man. Man, it'd be the end of the universe. If he talked like you, when you read that King James Bible, it'll be a boring book. 
Thank yeah. God that he talks the way he talks. Yeah. Leave the words alone. Yeah. And you PhD God. scholars don't have to be at pretend don't have to act and pretend you're so smart on relying Greek and Hebrew and saying, well, what the word means is this and what the word means is that and just, just shut up and leave the verse alone. Let it read as it says. Let it read as it says. By the way, at the end of verse 21, God saw that it was good. So it's all good. Okay, verse 22. And God blessed them. So God blessed these creatures saying, so how did he bless them? He told them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. So notice that how he blessed them is be fruitful. So producing fruit. So it's the same thing with the plant and vegetation where they produce fruit. If you look at that word in your Bible, fruit, and sometimes people use it today, that word is used where it's basically uh, life that you're bringing forth from your womb. So notice here that uh, they are to be fruitful, so multiply, so they are supposed to keep reproducing and producing, and fill the waters in the sea. So they're supposed to fill all the water that are in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. Let the birds spread out, multiply, and produce. So now I'm trying to use that term carefully. I probably used the word re one time, but you notice that the scripture here at verse 22, it never said re like reproduce or replenish. It just says fill, multiply, and fill uh, and fruitful. Why is that? Because this is the first time that they're doing that. Now, you might want to know that because look what God does at the next day. Uh, verse 23, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So 24 hours, fifth day, evening and morning. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. So now it's coming from the earth now, where the dry land is. Now God is producing animals and human from the dry land. So these are creatures in the land. And they are after his kind, all right? It's not a common ancestry. It's from themselves. Cattle, so there's cattle, and creeping thing. Creeping thing, any insects that you can think of. And the beast of the earth, so beasts that are wandering, roaming on the earth. These are land creatures after his kind, all from themselves. It's not a common ancestry outside of a different kind of animal. And it was so, and it came to pass. Uh, notice that God, he does not care, at verse 25, what he puts these classification of animals. He classifies uh, uh, all of his creation in six days. He doesn't do like a huge text. Uh, he does this all this classification system of all these different terms and names of all these animals like the scientists would do and calculate through billions of years. God doesn't do it that way. Verse 25, and God made the beast of the earth after his kind. So God repeats it again. And cattle after their kind. God repeats it again from verse 24. And everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. God repeats it again from verse 24. And God saw that it was good. So when God created all those things, he saw it as good. So notice that insects and the creeping things that all of you love today, those cockroaches, that all these creeping things, that basically they were created at the same day as where you would get your camel today, as where you would get your dog and cat today. Now, why is that important? What's important is because you guys know more than the PhD scientists. They didn't know that. You just made a scientific discovery that they never thought about before. They thought that the insects were like billions of years longer before we get the current dogs and cats and monkeys today. <laughs> the Lord says, yeah, it's not a problem for me. You know, I'll just put them all together. Now, continue, uh, continue reading on. Stop. We stop here. All right. So we will continue uh, on next time with the last part of God's creation, which is man. So God created man. So we will talk about man. Man is such an interesting creature. Yeah. And we'll cover that in our next Genesis study. Let's all close with the word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and that uh, you'll please bless the remainder of the services. Protect your people here. Help us to be able to keep 
freely worshiping you and to do what we're supposed to do to give glory and honor to your name. Thank you so much for all that you have done for us. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.